Thanks so much. And I'm very, I'm very fortunate. And actually, the reason I'm here today is because I think Gurdjieff, I think you cornered me one day after I'd put in a PD tube and said, <laughs> can you give a talk about exactly this thing? So, um, so here we are. So is this advancing? No. It's going to be a short talk. Um, maybe I'll just have to press the button. OK. I'll stand here. So um, disclosures, I have no financial disclosures to dis, uh, disclose. I realized afterwards I probably should have put on that I do insert bedside PD tubes. But those of you who do it know that it's not much of a financial conflict of interest. It's not <laughs> and, um, but the main one is I really like PD. I'm biased. Uh, and you know probably a lot of you are here today because you also really like PD. So that's probably the one thing to keep in mind. But by the end of the day, I think you'll all like PD even more. So we're going to talk about a few things around this idea of urge and start PD. So that's something that's been gaining a lot of traction, something we do a lot of, and I know other programs are doing as well. So we'll talk about some of the evidence around it. And then mainly what I want to spend a fair amount of time on is breaking down how we can actually support this. What are the things that we need to do within our dialysis programs to support urge and start PD? And then we'll show some of our, inf our data and our information from uh, Fraser Health. You heard uh, Yang or you heard Dr. Zhang talk a little bit about this yesterday morning. Uh, I'll share a little bit more of it in, in some detail. And then we can discuss at the end if, if uh, other programs want to share their, their experience also. So these are the, the items we'll touch on in the outline that, uh, that basically will take us right through it. So to jump right in, I think the first question actually to ask is what is Urgent Start PD? And it seems like an odd thing to ask. It seems self-explanatory. But then when you actually start breaking it down, you have to try to figure out who is it that we're talking about. We always talk about this concept of the parachuter, somebody who has no contact with the, the nephrology system whatsoever and, and crashes in and ends up on dialysis. So that's probably one of the types of people we're talking about. But then we have other people who are IPDing. You can tell this guy's IPDing because he's kind of not very happy and his effluent looks a little bit bloody. So he's probably doing IPD. He's like, why are you? What happened to me, and how did I get here? Um, oh, oh, now it's working. Um, and or are we talking about people who we put a fresh tube in? You can see the blood's not even dry yet, and we want to start using the tube. So these are probably all of these different people that we're talking about. And the reason that um, I mention this is because we can't agree on a definition when we when we're talking about urgent start PD in the literature. You see all kinds of different things out there. The one thing everyone does agree on is it's not emergent. Their potassium's not seven. We're not doing it right that second, because those people are probably ending up on, on hemo. I'm not even saying that, that this, is, this is a solution for those types of people. But other than that, we don't really know. We talk about people who had no nephrology experience beforehand, who need to start dialysis within a couple of weeks, or who need to start dialysis soon after the PD catheter. And I would say, oh, this is, I'm going to hold this backwards, because up is down and down is up on this thing. Um, and I think the definitions here are important because these all actually imply different patient groups, different patient populations. And the way that we're going to target and support them is actually slightly different. So we'll come back to this. But first, we, you know, I want to discuss a little bit about the importance of the initial modality somebody ends up on. Because that's really what we're talking about, getting pe people onto PD right at the get-go when they need renal replacement. We know that about half of our patients, when you give them proper education and proper choice, will choose to be at home. But we know even at the best of times, not everybody who says they want to go home or chooses to go on home ends up doing so. Our targets, what we use in Fraser and most of across BC, is around 85% conversion, chosen PD to actually going home on PD. But we know the truth is often lower than that. And we know that both of these items, both the choice of home dialysis and actually converting to home dialysis, are lower if you have no pre-renal uh, replacement therapy uh, education. So getting people home to start with and well supported actually does make a difference. And the other big thing is that we see, and you all, I'm sure you all see this in your programs, we see lots of patients go from PD to hemo, but not as many the other way around. And there is good data to, to show us that the longer they stay on hemo, the less likely they are to transfer. I, oh, there we go. I steal the concept from uh, Mike Copeland that he always talks about the price is right effect. Uh, and you know, when someone shows up on hemodialysis, you, their first uh, few runs, you see them, they're reading a book, they've got their laptop, they're working on things, they're engaged, they're asking you questions. But then if you do nothing and you don't educate them, you show up six months later, that same patient is kind of lying there watching prices right on TV. And he always says that once that happens, you've lost them to go home. In other words, people do become dependent the more you give them dependent care. So we want to try to get people at home quickly. 
I'll take this with a huge grain of salt. That's my little picture that, that'll come up a few times throughout this. But there is some evidence to say that people who go from hemodialysis to PD do not as well as people who start right off on PD. Now, the huge grain of salt is because, of course, again, that implies different patient populations. There's a reason we couldn't get them right home to begin with. But there is some evidence to say that maybe, maybe that's not a good trajectory of care. We should try to get them right to PD. And then the other thing that I want to put in your head before we start talking about the, um, uh, the, this whole concept and the evidence is why, are, why do we have this controversy? Why do people, when we do urgent PD, we kind of brag about it. We say, oh yeah, we're a program that does urgent start PD, as, in, as if that's you know, a huge accomplishment. We don't talk about urgent start other things. We don't, say, you know, we don't hear a program saying, I do urgent start hemodialysis. We all do urgent start hemodialysis. We know urgent start anything is more difficult than planned start uh, to that same treatment modality. But yet for PD, there's this specific hang up about doing it. And what I think a lot of the worry is about, this is saying I'm just giving up on the pointer. Um, what I think about a lot of the worry, it comes down to the fact that even our guidelines, and you know, everybody has these, these concerns, our guidelines, when you read this from the ISPD access guidelines, they actually seem to suggest that this is not really a great thing to do. They say you should have at least two weeks uh, between your catheter placement and starting PD. Yeah, if you really want to, you can do it in this kind of modified way, but that's not suggested. They're kind of leaning you away from that. And this is the worry, right? This is what we all talk about. They're just going to leak. If you put it in and use it right away, they're just going to leak. So I think before we you know, fall into that trap, we have to ask ourselves two very important questions. Is there actually evidence that there's risk of using the PD catheter too early or starting PD urgently? And if so, is that risk so bad that it eliminates the PD as an urgent start option? So, this is a huge table, and from back there, I'm sure you can't see any of it. But this, this is a paper that they collected all the data that, that is put out there about Urgent Start PD. You can see a lot of these are small trials. There's kind of 20 to 40 patients. There's only a couple that are into the hundreds. And they report all of the mechanical complications. You can't see all those numbers, but I'll tell you, most of them for things like leak and primary catheter dysfunction are below 10%. There are a few that are in the 10 to 15% range. That same ISPD guideline that I showed for planned start PD patients, they call anything less than 10% rate of leak or dysfunction acceptable. So in other words, from all these, these collection of trials that are out there, we're seeing rates of dysfunction and leak that are pretty similar to what we say is acceptable for any of our PD patients. And there was an even better paper that came out just this year actually in PDI where the, the authors took patients and they assigned them to three groups. The group one, I'll use this for the pointer, these people started IPD one week after their catheter insertion. Two is two weeks and three is three weeks. So that's how many, or sorry, 28 days. Uh, so that's four weeks. But so early, kind of in the middle, and a later start. And what they saw, their primary outcome was incidence of leak. So yes, the people who started uh, after just one leak, or after one week, had a higher incidence of leaking. But I want to point out, 80% of them did not leak. And you know the bigger thing that we want to actually look at, although leaking obviously is one thing, is were they able to stay on PD? What was their technique survival on PD? And actually, when you look at it, it does, there's no significant difference whatsoever. There was some suggestion that even on the longer term, the people that they waited longer didn't do quite as well as the people who they started right away. In other words, you don't want to drag their heels and leaving them lingering forever either. That's probably not a good thing. So yes, they might leak, but we can still keep these people on PD at rates of, at 60, uh, at 60 weeks, at rates of 85% uh, you know, success. So that's a whole lot of worry when at the end of the day these people are actually staying on PD. And then the guidelines, whenever people talk about it, they say, well, there's a higher rate of leak, there's a higher rate of all these complications, but why are we comparing urgent start PD to planned start uh, PD? If we had the option, of course we're going to do things in a, in a you know, nice controlled method, but this isn't an option when somebody crashes in here. We're comparing apples and oranges, and really I think the way to talk about it is this whole concept of suboptimal dialysis initiation, and this is something that we talk about in hemodialysis as well. These are really the factors. This is the group we're talking about, right? We haven't had a chance to educate them well. Maybe they're not getting onto their, their modality of choice or starting with a less than ideal access. And what I'm getting at here is that Urgent starts uh, patients are very, very different than planned start patients. 
So let's flip it on its head as well. Nobody seems to talk about this as much, but urgent start hemodialysis obviously has a lot of risks associated with it as well. And these are some big risks. So starting without, primary, without prior nephrology involvement, this is risk for 120, 120-day mortality. Those people tend to have worse mortality. Again, a different patient group than somebody we've known about for the last 10 years. But this is a big one. Starting dialysis with a CVC has a risk ratio of 1.6. That is worse than having coronary artery disease, worse than being diabetic. It's about the same as starting dialysis with active heart failure. So starting dialysis with a line is obviously not a good thing either. So what we really need to talk about is urgent start PD versus urgent start hemo. In other words, we know we're not in an ideal situation. We're scrambling to start somebody on dialysis. These are really our only two options in front of us. And so when we look at this, there's a few observational studies again they're very different patient groups, so it's hard to compare. There are a little bit of apples and oranges here. But at the least, what we can say is that there's no difference in six-month outcomes. And there's much more bacteremia because we're starting people on hemodialysis with a line. So they're having rates that, this is quite high from this cohort, but 20% uh, rates of bacteremia. A group that's gone through and analyzed this data kind of plotted it out this way. And I, I think this is you know, again, trying to put, wrap our head around the, the types of patients. So here, uh, this side of the graph is looking at our planned PD starts versus patients we know about and starting uh, with, a, with a line. Now, I would say this half of the graph isn't really as relevant because we're kind of comparing what I would say is the worst way of starting a planned patient with a CBC on hemodialysis to PD. So that's all well and good. But let's look at this side where we're talking about our unplanned patients, patients who had no prior modality uh, education. And although there was no significant difference, because we don't have the patient numbers to look at it, and we are comparing different populations, there is a, a trend towards worse mortality when you end up starting somebody on, uh, on urgent hemodialysis with a CVC. So I would say, yes, there might be a slightly higher risk of mechanical complications when we're starting people on PD early or urgently. But what we can definitely say is there's fewer severe infections. There's fewer episodes of bacteremia. I didn't put a bullet point here to mention mortality because there's, you know, we just don't have the evidence for that, and it's such different patient groups. But if really that's the, these are the two things ahead of us, I think that at the end of the day, when we look at the data, it's at least as safe, if not safer, than urgent start hemodialysis. So this whole concept, and I don't know why there's a picture of a stormtrooper here. I couldn't figure that out. But there's this concept of zero risk bias that we talk about, where when something is the way you've always been operating, you tend to kind of minimize the risks of that, even though the risk might be higher than your alternative. You won't go to a new alternative until somebody tells you that it's risk free. It's a perfect way of doing things. So whenever people start, you know, are, are uh, arguing against urgent start PD, they talk about things like the leaking and the mechanical complications, and we're just going to have to switch them over to hemodialysis later anyways. In other words, they're trying to make you prove to them that urgent start PD is safe when we know that just putting all those people on hemodialysis the line is probably a higher risk thing to do to them anyways. So that's my talk of the limited evidence that we have around urgent star PD. So hopefully we're all a little bit more on board uh, with it by now. But now let's talk about what do we actually need to do to support urgent star PD? How do we make this happen within our dialysis programs? So again, I want to come back to this and talk about these different patient groups that we're talking about. So that somebody who needs to start dialysis soon, not emergently, but soon, Maybe it's people who weren't known to us before and need to start soon, or maybe it's people that, for whatever reason, we need to get a tube into quickly and then start them uh, on renal replacement. We don't have that, wait, that luxury of waiting around multiple weeks for their PD tube to heal. So I, like to, I wanted to break this into kind of different camps of how people come to PD as their initial renal replacement modality. I keep saying here KCC. That's probably because I got lazy and just wanted to type three letters. But what I really mean is somebody who's had previous dialysis modality education and orientation. They've had the luxury of actually talking things through before they had to start. So we're always talking about parachuters, so I wanted to keep on that same kind of airplane uh, theme here. So this is our first class patient, right? Everything's been done 
the right way. Everything's nice and comfortable. And I also want to point out this is our first class patient because we should treat them as such. This is what we're trying to get people to do. We're trying to get people to go through their pre-dialysis education and choose a home modality. So we should treat this person well. We should refill their drinks. We should bring them whatever we want. This is who we want to support. So that's one way that people can come to, to PD. But a lot of our, our KCC patients end up actually starting acutely as well. So yes, we get them onto PD. I, I picked this because that looks kind of like a softer field that they could have landed in. You know, it's, it's not a jagged mountainside. So the person probably walked away from this, you know, and he's on PD. So that's, that's a good way of doing things. You know, they got onto it. Not as, not as comfortable, though, as, as the person who did this in first class. We do this every now and again, and this is a real accomplishment. So when somebody shows up in the hospital or an inpatient, not known to anybody whatsoever, and we get them onto PD in a controlled way, it's amazing. And the reason that I picked this picture is it takes a lot of skill from everybody involved. It's a whole team that it took to land this person on a freeway overpass. They are able to get onto a good modality safely. The people here definitely walked away from this. And the part that you couldn't really see, if we could extend this picture, there's probably a whole lineup of cars back here and a whole lineup of cars back there that got congested and jammed up because we had to block down a runway to get this person to land uh, and to get this plane to land on the, on the freeway overpass. And then more often when we're talking about q PD, this is our person. <laughs> Right? We have no idea what's going on. They're, they're in the emergency. We're trying to figure out how the heck can we actually get this person to land. This person is not enjoying themselves nearly as much as this one. So a few people have gone through this and thought about this systematically and come up with frameworks. What are the series of things we need to do to get our urgent uh, start patients onto PD at home successfully? And we're going to talk about each of these items in turn. But it's really, it's quite logical when you go through this. So somebody shows up, you need to figure out, are they a PD candidate? And do they agree to do PD? You have to somehow get a PD tube into them. You need to then start dialyzing them, because if it's an urgent start, it's not like they can go home the next day. You need to dialyze them in your PD unit. Then you train them, and then they go home. So let's talk about each of these in turn. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to rapidly mobilize to educate and orient this person to PD. And this takes a lot of flexibility from our team. And the people who work with me know that myself and some other people in the group will show up when we're on inpatient rotation, just walk up to the PD desk and say, you need to go here and talk to this person, because by the way, I think I want to put a PD tube in them in a couple of days. So can you orient them? Now, this not only takes flexibility from our staffing standpoint, but the other huge thing to remember is these are not well patients. There's a reason that we want to start them on dialysis you know, very, very well. So you need to not just talk to the patient. You need to get the family involved, see what support system they have, and see it, you know, it, it takes a little bit more work than your person uh, who shows up to KCC as a well person getting their orientation. To really feel them out and see are they going to be able to support that is a little bit harder, because you're kind of seeing them at their worst you know, when they've just crashed into the hospital. And this, so, so to do this, what these several items here say is that you need to have a team-based objective assessment of their candidacy. So you're trying to figure out not only do they have the, the physical and mental capacity to do this, are they supported enough at home, uh, and is their home environment stable enough to do this? The reason I put this little checkbox note here is although we get these nice, big, beautiful um, pieces of paper that are filled out by our PD team after they've done the orientation, that talks about their candidacy, and it's two pages long, front and back, there's really only one thing that most of us look at, and it's the check mark. Do you think this person is going to fly or not? And that's where our teams, who have so much PD experiences, our social workers, our nurses, who deal with these patients day in and day out, they can tell you by looking at somebody. You give them a yes or no question, they'll say, yeah, that person is going to fly or no. And this is worth its weight in gold, that check mark from the whole team saying, yeah, I think this person will, I think this person will do well. So we need to mobilize people. And then we've decided, OK, we're going to go ahead and, and, and start PD. So we need to get a PD catheter into them. So the first part of this is obviously a, a, a examining their abdomen to see what's going on. Um, and then we need to talk about our pre-procedure pr uh, uh, preparation. Now, I put this here because this happens to me not often. It's been very, very rare, actually. But you know, being one of the people who puts PD tubes in, not everybody does it. And in, sometimes in the 
excitement of trying to get somebody onto PD urgently, you kind of show up in the room and you know I've, I've done this actually in the procedure room when someone's shown up and you think my goodness has anybody actually lifted this person's shirt before uh, and looked at their belly to see if they're if they're a candidate that's a gross exaggeration but I just kind of like that picture oops but um, the other big thing is our preparation so we have all of us have these big long you know pre um, catheter insertion pre-printed orders you need to be off your calcium for a week you need to be off your iron for a week well often that goes out the window a good bowel prep will take care of that anyways um, but even things like uh, anticoagulants and this one is a big big area of controversy and of course we have no uh, evidence for this but remember we're talking about urgent start and you know, as, as the people who work with me know, I've done some people who have a fresh drug eluting stent and they're stuck on dual antiplatelets. You can't just tell them to come off of that. You can't, and you also don't have the luxury of waiting until they no longer have an indication for that. So it's again tr trying to wrap your head around what are my options here? Your op when your options are to put a, dial a hemodialysis line in someone or a perm cath, I would actually argue that, or sorry, or a PD catheter, I would actually argue that the PD catheter is the less risky option in those people on dual antiplatelet therapy. Now, I have no evidence to support that, and I'm never going to have evidence to support that. But it just highlights the fact that sometimes you're going to be in a not ideal situation. And you have to remember, that's because these are not ideal patients. You don't have the luxury of getting everything into a perfect world situation. And then if you've decided you're going to place the catheter, you need to figure out who is going to do it. So us, if they're a bedside candidate, fantastic. One of the nephrologists will do it. This is kind of what we look like doing this because you know it, this takes a lot of rescheduling and rejigging and and working with your schedule. We all have busy days. We'll have to scrap time or set aside some time to do this. Um, the units that I work know that I have a bad habit of that when it's really short notice, I say, oh well, we can just do it first thing in the morning, which means a different thing for me than I think the PD unit is used to. You know, we'll do it at eight o'clock in the morning before everybody else starts their day, so that we can actually get it in. We'll have to move around patients in the office so that we can actually get it in. We'll have to juggle our existing wait list. We did this just earlier this week, where we had someone who we were, we were going to do a planned PD tube and said, actually, that spot's now getting moved to this person who needs it right now. Um, so it takes a lot of effort to make that happen. And if it's a surgical one, oh my goodness, it takes even more effort. Because not only do you need buy-in from the surgical team, you need somebody from the renal side who can actually help kind of triage and flag, OK, if you're, if you're going to make your surgeon drop what they're doing to get a PD tube into somebody, um, you, know, you better not be doing that frequently, and you better have a good reason to do it. So you kind of need somebody championing that from the renal standpoint to figure out what's your appropriate way of doing that. And it takes a lot of you know, cross-discipline communication, whether it means admitting the patient so that they can do this on the add-on slate um, you know, or, or creative ways around that. So this is actually you know, a big effort. But actually, a bigger effort is actually starting to dialyze the person. Because that was a one-time episode, right? Getting the catheter in them, and we, and we did that. So now we have to actually start using the dialysis catheter. So this is the recommendations by everyone. If you are going to do IPD, is that you should have specific training nurses who are familiar with accessing the tube in a freshly you know, uh, placed uh, tube and specific dialysis regimens. I put this because most of our hospitals, at, in Fraser Health, all of our hospitals do PD, and the similar thing is happening in most other jurisdictions where it's happening more and more on the inpatient wards. We cohort the patients who do PD into certain areas where presumably the nurses have, uh, or I shouldn't say presumably, but where the nurses have more experience with PD. But even those nurses who feel like they're quite good with PD, you know, we specifically tell them, hands off, our PD unit is taking care of this. You don't touch the tube, you don't do anything with the tube. This was just put in a couple of days ago. We're the ones who are, gonna, who are gonna take this here. Now, if people, if the programs ever get big enough, maybe that could, could diffuse out into the ward. But I think that this is such a, a relatively smaller group of patients that, that if you're gonna devote any energy uh, from your PD staff, um, for doing IPD rather than letting any other nurse do it. This is really the group, right? We don't want anybody to kind of, uh, you know, muck up our newly placed tubes. And this is probably the, one of the biggest sources of where we really have to think about our resource planning. Because you, you, need, you need to not just put a tube into this person, but they'll need to IPD until such time as they're able to train and go home. And the guidelines all say, well, you know, then once you put the tube in, IPD them for two weeks or the two-week mark, fantastic, train them, and they can go home. But again, these are not well patients. 
I can think of a few examples that come to my mind quite clearly of people who were IPD for four, you know, five weeks, six weeks even, um, because they just weren't well enough. They were still in and out of the hospital, maybe admitted the whole time. Um, you know, so it's not just a short little block of IPD. You really need to be able to keep this person dialyzed, which is a huge um, impact on our dialysis unit, both in terms of space and in terms of staff. And then this step was missing, actually, from the algorithm that I showed. And so I, I put it as an extra step. And that's identifying complications. Because this is what everyone was worried about to, to begin with, right? Before we started doing urgent start PD, everybody was worried about this patient who was going to spring a leak. Now, we know from those reports that I showed you earlier that somewhere in the order of 10% of people to 15% of people will experience that. So again, I, I want to reemphasize that means 85% of people will not, and they'll be perfectly fine. But for the few that do, you can still get around it. Remember that trial that I showed you from PDI this year, that they kept everybody on PD. Even the ones who had leaks, over 80% of them still stayed on PD. You sometimes end up being creative with your prescription, going to vo lower volumes. Uh, you know, maybe you give them a couple days off if they can tolerate it, or even longer than that if they can tolerate it. But with a little bit of manipulation, you can keep these people on PD. It's hard work. It's not easy, especially when things come up. But you can try to keep these people on PD. And that report from earlier this year was a great evidence uh, that, that speaks to that. Then eventually, they've IPD'd for a while, and you can actually start training them and getting them to go home. So the training can begin once the tube is healed and the patient's well enough. And, and, and as I would say, in our experience, this is the limiting factor. right? People always say two weeks for IPD. IPD and then go ahead, train them, and send them home because you've had that two-week healing time now. Um, but in our experience, when we're truly talking about unwell people, um, it's probably when they're in shape to actually go home and learn how to train. And this also can take some flexibility because if, if they've been sitting there IPDing now for several weeks, you kind of do want to get this person trained so you can free up that spot, both in terms of physical spot and nursing staff uh, in your dialysis unit. So this is where you sometimes are having to play with your cue a little bit. And maybe the person who had a surgical tube and can wait another week or two before they train gets bumped a little bit uh, longer than this person who you've been devoting all this energy to IPDing for a month, and you kind of just need to get them home. That was cue jumping. I don't know. I really like that. This was, I think, the highlight of my presentation. Um, so. I'm going to talk about our experience in Fraser Health, but you know, I really think I can summarize it in a couple of words, and that's that Urgent Start PD is a lot of work. So Dr. Zhang presented some of our data specific to Surrey yesterday morning. This is actually Fraser Health as a whole. And we had some trouble trying to get this data in that it's a little bit hard to tease out. So first you have to figure out what definition you're going to use, and then you're going to have to see, do we have the data within Promise or anywhere to try to actually identify it? Um, it was a little bit harder, and we found, you know, I think, we, I think with, uh, with a little more effort, we probably could figure out um, people who had a very short duration between two placement and starting uh, IPD. That was a little bit harder. So what we just went with is people who went straight onto IPD without any prior renal replacement before then, because that's an easier number to get. And this is what we see. We've been doing more of it over the last few years. This is 2017 up until September 1st, right? So we're definitely going to surpass the year before that um, with you know three months left of data to add on to that. So we've been doing more and more IPD, at least. So we've been dialyzing people um, before they're ready to train. Now, before I break that down a little bit, uh, I wanted to come to this point that you know, that whole thing about IPD, all those items that we had in that flowchart takes a whole team of people, right? We can't just stand here and, and say that we've been doing more every year because you know, um, a couple of us have decided to put in tubes and a couple of our PD units have been nice enough to agree and let us put in tubes. Um, it takes a whole lot of work, and I, I can't say that enough. Our whole team is, is responsible for getting those numbers up. So let's talk about what we need to build into our, our, our program a little bit more. So for staffing, um, this is an issue for us on a couple of fronts. So those tube insertions that we're scrambling and you know that they're nice enough to let me do at 8 o'clock in the morning, um, that's an easy thing for me to ask, but it means moving around somebody's shift for the day. So that's hard to do. 
then we need to get time to, um, to do the IPD. Sometimes for many, many weeks, we're moving people around. And as I said, the orientation comes up. So this is not a small thing. There actually has to be capacity in your dialysis unit to do this. So when we say something like build in capacity for urgent starts, that's all well and good. But I know the dialysis, the PD programs on the province, it's not like any of them are sitting around idle and not seeing patients or anything like that. Right? So anything you do comes at the expense of something else that you're doing. So it does, it does require a lot of flexibility to be able to do this. And that's why I think triaging is a must. And by triaging, I mean you really need to know what's coming in your PD program. Because although nobody's sitting around idle, we do know that we're going to be doing IPD and we know that we're going to be training. So that's already kind of built into our workload. So we want to play around with what's coming through. And the main source of that is from our other renal programs. So that you can't just be a PD unit isolated unto itself. Uh, not communicating with anyone else. You need to know from the KCC who's in the pipeline, what is the surgical you know, insertions looking like and who's getting their tubes put in soon, and what are you going to, um, what are you going to be expecting in terms of the, the training uh, burden that's coming to your unit, um, and who amongst those people who are coming to you can be moved around, because flexibility is really the key here. Triaging to say, this person needs to start right now, and maybe this person can delay their training by a week is a huge, uh, huge area of success here. And the reason that I say we need to be in communication with our units is, is, is this. And this is something that we need to break down a little bit more in Fraser Health, and I think that we need to start breaking down um, across the province a little bit more. Dr. Zhang talked about the similar thing yesterday, where most of our IPD or urgent start or however you want to define it, most of those patients are coming from our KCC. They're patients that we already know about. The true you know, crash lander in emergency who has no contact with the world beforehand and we get onto PD right away is the minority of these people. So these are the people that I would argue, we're always going to, and, and uh, to, to be perfectly fair here, we're always going to have some people who move from this group into the, into the parachuter group. So in other words, we're always going to have people who were in KCC, rock solid for years, and then something happened to them and they need to start dialysis right away. That's unavoidable. But I do bet that in this bar, there is some room to move where maybe with a little bit of communication, maybe with some better predicting tools, that we, if we can develop that in the future, we can move some of this out of this bar and actually into that first class lounge that we want the patients into, into a prepared uh, P PD start. Because these people, although this, this bar looks so much smaller than this one, I can tell you that this one is a mountain of work. These 11 patients take so much effort uh, to actually support them and keep them at home without ever requiring dialysis. And that's really what I'm, what I'm talking about here, is that these people got out of the plane, they landed in the nice soft field, but can we actually make them into a smooth start? In other words, I would say that, and it might seem weird to, to kind of come to this conclusion in an urgent start PD um, talk, but I would say that the, probably the single biggest way we can support urgent start PD is to do less urgent start PD. So if we can take those patients and turn them into smooth initiations, then we have time to extinguish this fire and get this person to land, uh, land on the ground. So I think to be able to support that in the future, like I say, we need, this is an ongoing quality improvement thing that we're working on. And it's a really, really hard one to pin down because we're dealing with a whole different group of unpredictable patients. That's really what we're talking about here. You know, if they were predictable, they wouldn't be urgent starts. So just that nature of it makes it difficult to study and figure out. And I think one of the things that we're gonna have to come to in the end is trying to figure out actually um, who do we need to, um, to devote our effort to who in our KCC, of that big group of people who were IPDing from, from our KCC, which of those can we actually say, well, you know what, maybe they don't need to have their tube right this second. We can let them go through the, er, through the uh, usual pathways um, and let that play out. Because um, I can tell you anecdotally, being the one who's putting in the tubes, um, we get, you know, someone says, oh yes, this person needs to start immediately. And you'll kind of put the tube in, and you'll look at the patient, and you know they're not that fluid overloaded, and their blood work's looking okay. And you know, did they really need to start urgently? Did we really need to kind of move, you know, heaven and earth to get a tube into this person and IPD them and train them right now, or could they have waited a little bit longer? And that's that's I think when we we can start shifting that around, um, so that we truly uh, have the the bandwidth to focus on 
the sicker patients, I think that's when this will really become a little bit easier. So in summary, if you leave after this talk, I want the, the couple of points I want people to go home with is one, I, I would say, you know, hands down, Urgent Start PD is not only possible, it's at least as safe, if not safer, than the alternatives. We are talking about sick people who need to start dialysis soon. They don't have a lot of good options in front of them. What's the best of the options they can pick? And to me, that would be Urgent Start PD. This is a team, this is a team based approach. This is not something we do as nephrologists by ourselves. And in fact, our part is the easy one. You know, just, just putting the tube, asking Gurjeet to schedule the person in and putting the tube into it. That's the small part. It's how do we support them through their IPD and training and, and streamlining, doing less of this so that we can focus on the, the, the patients who truly need it is what's going to make this uh, successful. Um, a few people to thank, the people that I work with, who I, you know, I have the privilege and the pleasure of doing this and doing this, this valuable work and all the, all the programs around the province. Just a few things to prove that I didn't make up everything that I was talking about. And then um, we'll kind of open up the floor to any questions. Oh, stand-up questions obviously get to go first. If you're going to okay, walk sorry. up to the microphone. I, I got in trouble yesterday for not standing. Um, thanks, Mike. That was great. I have a couple questions that are somewhat um, unrelated to each other. Sure. Um, so the first question would go back to, I mean, if we look at the Hong Kong experience where they're able to get 80% of people, it's really a mindset. And it's a mindset that um, PD is your option. Um, yeah. You know, and, and the North American mindset is that your default is hemo. Um, so thoughts uh, on that and specifically um, about potentially doing um, PD and intensive care units um, would be the first one. So we'll park that. Uh, the second question was um, related to um, urgent starts and trying to get fewer of them. Um, and I wonder about your thoughts on um, incremental PD. Um, given that, you know, certainly recently with the intent to delay strategy, um, we're doing that for everybody and delaying everybody. And I think we uh, sometimes get ourselves in trouble uh, in that, you know, we're waiting too long and then it becomes urgent. Um, and you wonder if maybe that incremental start might uh, help in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so the first one about the mindset uh, of going to, to PD, I, I couldn't agree more actually. And this is something that we kind of bang our heads against the wall. That, um, you know, I said that with Urgent Start PD, it's really the staffing and the capacity to IPD them and things like that that seem to be one of our big, big uh, barriers here, our big challenges. But nobody ever kicks up any fuss if we've had to start five people on acute hemodialysis in a week staffing appears, people get called in for overtime, and we move heaven and earth and run them off ward. Um, so we're more than willing to throw whatever resources we have to start someone acutely on hemodialysis, but yet when we start talking about doing that with PD, all of a sudden it's not a great idea and we don't have the staff or resources to do it. So I, I couldn't agree more that it's, a, that it's a mindset. And in terms of, uh, of intensive or, or high, you know, uh, high care patients, We've done a couple in CCU. The CCU people seem to be a little bit more willing to listen to us. ICU, it's a non-starter that, you know, how would you ever do it? And in fact, I'm sure you fought this battle. Um, somebody shows up in the ICU on PD already as a pre-existing PD patient, and they want to switch them over because they don't believe that PD is a thing that works. And it's like, you're doing what with their abdomen? Because uh, there's no, you know, they're used to numbers and machines and things that they can dial in exactly what they want. And I think they find that lacking at PD. So um, yeah, I agree that it's, it's kind of shifting the, um, you know, the, the whole mindset of everybody that no, no, this is our default treatment. And, um, and it is something that we can do in sick patients and we can do successfully in sick patients. And the last people, it's not just our, our, the people who provide care, it's also within our programs and, and the administration that if we're always willing to support whatever we need to do to get someone on hemodialysis acutely, why does that not transfer over to PD? And if I need to call in someone, you know, call in overtime or we need to get an extra staffing, that's where we throw the resources. So I couldn't agree more. And then, um, was that both your questions? Incremental start. Incremental start. Oh, yes. Love the idea of incremental start, actually. So um, you know, we've actually started talking about that in Fraser. We are starting to go more towards saying, OK, you know what? At 10, this is probably time to put the tube in. Um, and if this means that you know, we show somebody how to do one extra kneel overnight, one, they're probably not as uremic when it comes time to train. And your units will thank you uh, for that. You know, we've, Kind of not having the patient sitting there in the chair, you know, trying to stay awake uh, as they're learning, um, and um, and yeah, it's a way of kind of smoothing out, turning some of that workload into predictable workload. Uh, 
rather than, like you said, waiting for them to crash in. So I, I'm a huge believer. I didn't show any of the, the information on it, but I'm a huge believer in incremental starts. Yeah, oh, sorry, sorry and then she, but uh, Shelly's up, and then um, you have to stand up if you want to get your question <laughs> right away. I do. <laughs> <laughs> My question is around patients that are um, getting transplanted. Mm -hmm. We always have a backup plan for them, and some of them need to have a little bit of dialysis because maybe they get sick or timing, whatever. Um, do you think that we should honor their backup choice as PD and use PD as a bridge rather than hemo? Absolutely. Because or is there a time frame that you think? No, I don't think there's any time frame. Again, people always seem to think that, that putting a PD tube into somebody is this big ordeal, but putting a tunneled catheter into them is nothing. We know these are the people who get infections. The tunneled catheter, that's who gets infection. If anything's going to compromise their ability to be transplanted, it's getting a good you know, bout of bacteremia. So I, I don't think at all. You know? So we put a PD tube into someone and we're taking it a couple months out, or taking it out a couple months later, no problem. I think that's still a fantastic outcome for the patient. So absolutely. Hi, Mike. And yeah. Nice talk. Um, just do you know any literature comparing, say, ICU and ICU setting, the PD versus hemo and the mortality difference? So not from you know North American experience. You know, only really places that that this is their modality of dialysis. Period. Um, I think Brazil has some that they've shown in people in critical care, uh, but never in any kind of randomized or any type of you know similar group fashion yeah. that, I, that I'm aware of. There is a theoretical concern, right? If someone's having septic shock, I mean, what is the circulation going to the peritoneum? I mean, I would imagine will be cut low, right? Because you need to, you know, blood go to the critical organ. So may not have enough blood supply in the peritoneum to support the PD exchange. Sure, which, which I guess would, you know, manifest as it's not working that well or that, you know, you might not get as good of transfer. But at the end of the day, it wouldn't be, you know, hemodynamic instability, having to crank up their pressors, losing fingers and things like yeah, that. Yeah, and so, also, I mean, how comfortable are you, say, handling potassium 7 with PD? Yeah, so that's why I was saying, you know, for these these absolute emergent indications, no, I agree, we're we're not there. But when we're talking about somebody who, you know, was going in for their heart surgery and they already had CKD four, and now it looks like they're going to need to start sometime soon, uh, because you know things yeah. are kind of going downhill. That, that, that that's the person agree. that, that we all agree. Yeah, Just exactly. The, the that's ICU we're setting about. is a little tough too, sometimes. And it depends why they're there, right? It's it's what else yeah. is going on in the patient. Thanks. But to say that it's that it's not an option at all, or uh, often that the mindset is frankly that people need to be switched. Oh yeah, um, I'm not debating the yeah, uh, your your yeah your fundamental message. Yeah, yeah, just saying some exceptions. Of course, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, I was really interested in the fact that you said that you'd done some of the bedside insertions on pa patients on dual antiplatelets. Um, this is a problem I've run into only once, but we manage our patient in a very different manner um, because I couldn't get anybody to be interested in putting the catheter in, so neither bedside nor surgeon were interested, and actually the surgeon waited um, sort of the requisite um, minimum acceptable period of time after the patient's MI um, and took the patient to the OR, did the general anesthetic, and even used pediatric size um, laparoscopy equipment. And I thought, oh, that sounds also appropriate. So I'm wondering if you could share your experience on the dual antiplatelets, how many patients you've done, and your thoughts about bleeding. Because yeah. I think if they do bleed, they're in pretty big trouble in terms of infection risk. Yeah, we've had, um, I had one bleed. Uh, and someone who was already anemic. And it was just from, you know, a little subcutaneous perforator that we couldn't get to stop for some time, ended up needing one unit of blood from it. That was the worst outcome that I've had. Number of patients I've done, I don't know, I've done five or six of them in the last mm -hmm. little while over in Abbotsford. And mm -hmm. what I always do is I talk to the patient beforehand. And I think this is where your informed consent process really is so important because you're laying down what are the options in front of you. Because I would also say that if somebody you know, has a bad bleed when they get their perm cath insertion, if they happen to be that one, you know, that one in a hundred to one in a couple of hundred patients who has a very bad outcome, then, then we're probably in a much bigger uh, problem. The PD tube insertion itself is a, it tends to be a fairly bloodless procedure. If you're going to have bad bleeding, you would have had it anyways. It means you've either hit the, uh, you know, the inferior epigastric if you're having internal bleeding, or you've got one of these superficial vessels that was going to bleed anyways. So in terms of so it's not like a, the, the dual antiplatelet is, I think, creating the complications. It means if it's going to happen, it's going to be worse, which is always 
the, what's in front of the patient who's on dual antiplatelet and needs to start dialysis anyways. So when I tell the patients, I, I tell them, look, you are at higher risk of bleeding because you're on this when I'm doing the procedure, but I don't think that the other options available to you are that attractive either. I don't think putting a perm cath in you is, is necessarily lower risk than doing it this way. We'll never have that data, but if I had to guess, I'd say that's a higher risk thing to do. That's super helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I might refer my colleagues to, to chat with you about their experience. And um, you might be interested to know that I had a very determined patient, and despite being on hemodialysis for three months, she did eventually go to PD, and she's still happily on PD. Oh, fantastic, yeah. And that's always, yeah, if they're when they're established and if they can wait, that's a, that's a different story, yes, but yeah. Sure. I, I, um, I'd say yes and no. I also happen to you know, sit on the, the PD Assist group. And um, I, I think when we're thinking about PD Assist, at least in its present form, we have to remember what is it actually supporting. And right now, PD Assist in its present form is really a lot of the physical and manual tasks to do with PD, whereas you still need someone around who can do the troubleshooting, who can help with the connections, and who can make some treatment decisions. So when you're making that decision, of is PD Assist going to uh, get this person home, I think the real question is, what are the barriers here? If it's a lack of social support and you know, a person who doesn't necessarily have the cognitive capacity to do dialysis in the home, then at least in its present form, PD Assist is not the answer for that. Yeah, if, if they have those other you know, uh, factors that would, make, that would enable them to do dialysis at home, that's actually something we saw in, in our pilot when we did PD and we were tracking the data, is that we did have, I forget the exact number off the, off the top of my head, but it was a non-zero number of patients come off of PD Assist. In other words, we think that just by having someone to help them out and kind of a little bit of hand-holding, if you want to call it that, a little bit of support, a little bit of someone to talk to and see that this is a feasible thing, they then eventually said, ah, you know what, I can do this by myself. I don't need assist anymore. So yeah, you know, in some situations, a case-to-case -case, um, you know, assessment for sure. And, th and that's where I couldn't agree more, that that's what the initial evaluation is for. If, if you really want to be detailed about anything, it's, it's um, you know, trying to figure out if this patient's going to fly or not. The last thing you want to do is go through all of this work for someone who couldn't really do home dialysis uh, or had barriers to home dialysis anyway. That's, that's a huge point. Yeah, some of our patients, especially as we're trying to rework our, our training schedule, they've been IPD long enough, they, won't, they just, you know, they're saying, for crying out loud, let me just do this. Like, you know, I see what you're doing. You walk in and you, do, you, you hook up this bag a couple times. I can do that. So, uh, yeah, it, it does help. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, thanks, Dr. Bevelopo. That was great. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you.